Good morning, everyone. Welcome to The Sci-Files, an impact exposure series focusing on student research here at Michigan State University. We're your co-hosts, Chelsea Boudou and Daniel Puentes. This summer, our theme is focusing on the relationship between graduate student mentors and their undergraduate student mentees. Mentoring is an important part of research and helps students develop into the scientists of today. Today, we're here with Anastasia Lavelle and Cameron De La Mora. May you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Anastasia Lavelle. I'm a biochemistry and molecular biology graduate student. I work with Dr. Benning uh, studying plant lipids. And I'm Cameron De La Mora. I'm a rising senior at Illinois State University. And I'm here this summer for a REU internship put up by the National Science Foundation for Plant Genomics. Well, that's great to hear. Can you tell us a little bit about what department the REU program is sponsored through? Is it through biomolecular biology or? Uh, no, it's just you can have uh, students from different programs like uh, plant breeding and everything, but it's put up by the NSF. So uh, as long as your project has to do with genomics or genetics, then you can get a student. Oh, so this is an interdisciplinary REU almost then? Yeah. Uh, I'm from biology, and right now I'm in a biochemistry lab, so it's a brand new experience for me. What project are you guys working on together? So the project that we're working on this summer is um, a small subset of my thesis work, and uh, it's to characterize, uh, we're trying to characterize a protein that is found in the chloroplasts of a plant model species, um, Arabidopsis. And uh, we're trying to figure out what its molecular action is. Is there a particular reason why you're studying this plant? Or is it to gain a better general understanding of how these lipids are produced in the first place? Well, exactly uh, what you were getting at is that this plant is a convenient model. So we use it as a tool to understand how certain genes uh, may produce proteins that have a certain function in plants. And it's uh, easy to manipulate their genome, uh, genetics and uh, to study them. Uh, so this could be transferable to other more complex plants that are more difficult to study in the lab. So that's why we're studying this plant in particular. But this gene seems to be important for the way the chloroplast makes the membranes for thylakoids. And that's um, the, the hub where photosynthesis happens, where plants convert solar energy to chemical energy. And what are chloroplasts and thylakoids? I think I pronounced that correctly. Uh, chloroplasts are um, kind of the green component of plants. They kind of house all of the photosynthetic um, proteins. And the green part is chlorophylls. So you have um, this organelle inside plant leaves that helps harvest uh, light energy from the sun. As well as the thylakoids. The thylakoids are kind of the special membrane that chloroplasts have that concentrate all the proteins that are necessary to make this process happen. What proteins are you looking at particularly? We're looking at one protein in particular. Uh, it's called rhomb rhomboid-like protein 10, or RBL10 for short. It's um, kind of a interesting protein by itself uh, because it's a multi-pass membrane protein so it's you know within the membrane and it's actually carrying out proteolysis so it breaks up other peptides other proteins so it cleaves them what do you hope to gather from this experiment so cameron um is helping me try to home in on the exact nature of the cleavage that this protein um, does, carries out. And there's a few experiments that um, I wanted to do this summer that maybe he can um, say a few words about. Yeah, basically, Anastasia showed me some other papers where they weren't able to tag the protein, uh, which is a method where you can detect the proteins uh, based on their concentration. So there were some papers that couldn't detect it when you tag it on the C-terminus end of the protein, which is basically one end. There's an N-terminus and a C-terminus, and since they weren't getting the C-terminus tags to work properly, uh, Anastasia kind of thought maybe it's cleaving itself instead of a different protein. So we set up an experiment to see if 
this protein was cleaving itself, so we did use a C-terminus tag. And Anastasia developed a model where you could mutate the amino acids that were responsible for the cleaving, and that would stop its function because you're mutating the amino acids it needs to do the cutting. And that experiment worked out successfully, so we proved that, at least with preliminary data, we proved that uh, when you mutate those regions, the protein cannot cut itself, so you can detect it with a C-terminus tag. Can you remind our listeners why amino acids are even important for this process in the first place? So amino acids are the building blocks that make up proteins that um, are, proteins are commonly referred to as enzymes if they have some sort of important function. These proteins and enzymes have uh, a variety of functions in all of our bodies and cells and in plants and bacteria. So we need to understand the contributions of all these amino acids to how the protein, overall protein function actually um, what their contribution is to the overall function. And so the really important part of this experiment or set of experiments was that uh, we kind of confirmed the importance of two particular amino acids out of 360 to have an important function for the function of this overall enzyme. I want to take a step back because I am not a plant researcher. First of all, do you grow the plant? And if you do, is it outside or is it in a greenhouse? We grow these plants in a controlled environment, uh, in a growth chamber. So we control how much light it gets, for how long, how much humidity there is. Uh, we water it, you know, regularly. So, um, so they're they're grown in a controlled environment. So we don't we don't really do greenhouse or field experiments like other scientists do. I'm sure some RU students this summer are trekking out to the field and collecting samples that are out in the open, but our um, work is much more focused on controlling all the variables. All right, so you have the plants in a controlled environment, and then do you get the leaves to get the cells out of the leaves? Like, How do you perform these experiments and do all these genomic assays on them? Well, I could tell you about how you uh, genotype the plants. Basically, it's not that high tech. You get something like a hole puncher, and you take out a punch of the leaf, and you have to clean the tool every time so that the DNA from one plant doesn't get mixed up with the DNA from the next one. And uh, from there, you can use certain techniques to tell whether they have the mutation or not. Um, it's called genotyping. You need uh, some basic procedures like gel electrophoresis, and you have to know how to design primers to attach to that gene so that it can be replicated and amplified. So the primers are used to, like you said, amplify the signal of interest that you want to look at. So yeah, a, a primer is basically 20 nucleotides long, and it's designed to be complementary to one strand of the DNA, so that when you heat up the DNA in something called a thermocycler, which controls the heat of the reaction, you can denature the main strand of DNA so that they separate, and then that little primer can bind to the one it's supposed to. And enzymes called polymerases can bind to those primers, and then they copy the rest of the gene for you. And you can then use that DNA later for other techniques like digestions, where if there's a certain point mutation that would prevent the DNA from being lysed by restriction enzymes, which are meant to cut at certain sequences, they're usually about five bases long. Um, if you mutate that, it can't cut it. So you can get a different band lengths expected, and you can compare them to the parent controls and the wild-type parents as well. And based on the length of the bands, you can tell which ones are mutants and which ones are wild-type. And then to bring it back to the plant itself, I'm, I'm just curious. How big is this plant? Is it natural to the Michigan area? So this plant has been used by research scientists for um, a couple decades at least. And uh, the wild, uh, for, uh, wild variety of this plant is actually was first discovered in Columbia. It's Columbia 1, or Columbia 0. So there's a couple different varieties of this uh, Arabidopsis plant. We mostly use Columbia 0 as our model. 
I'm sure you can find it in the wild, but I think it originated from Colombia. I feel like I've heard about Rabidopsis before. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it like a really good plant model? And if so, why is it such a good plant model? Um, it's a, it is indeed a good plant model for at least uh, dicot plants. It has a small genome size. It's um, easy to transform or introduce new genes into it. Um, you can do crosses where you cross two different mutants together um, to uh, get um, multiple mutations from the two separate individuals. So it's also pretty small. Um, it's probably two, three, two, maybe two feet tall at its tallest. Um, so it's easy to grow indoors in control environments because I'm not sure if you've seen a cornfield, but sometimes corn can get huge and wheat can get really big. So a lot of times it's difficult to have space, actually, for scientists to research uh, crops that are very large. But now, nowadays, uh, scientists are coming uh, up with new technology where they can actually work directly with some more complex crop plants. I'd like to add to that. Um, it's also a very good reference genome because almost all the genes in the plant have been characterized and annotated. So they've been described. And let's say you're working with tobacco or tomatoes. You can find a gene there, and then if you're not quite sure what it is, you can use a computer to blast it to the Arapidopsis genome. And if you come up with a close match, that's called homology. So you can make an argument that a gene you find in tobacco is a certain gene that's already been described before, and maybe no one studied it in your model system before. I think this leads back to creating a catalog of different types of proteins and what their function might be, enabling people to work with harder, uh, less characterized plants and be able to say, well, we know in Arabidopsis that these proteins do X, Y, or Z. It's likely that um, this, these proteins might do the same thing because they're very similar in their amino acid composition. So kind of back to the amino acid thing, um, kind of directing the function of the protein. It sounds like then that Arabidopsis is like a plant biology analogy towards the fruit fly that is often studied when they're doing genomics in undergraduate and graduate courses. I also think of mice because the, the mouse genomics is also really well known compared to rats. Exactly. Those are perfect analogies for uh, what Arabidopsis is to most plants. Kind of piggybacking off of that, do you translate your, your research with Rabidopsis to other plants as well? We do consider the transferability uh, of our research. So the particular pathway uh, this protein is involved in might be important in some plants, but not all plants. So there is a particular component of the chloroplast, as we talked about. The chloroplast makes certain lipids. And this pathway is active in some plants, but not all plants. For example, uh, tomatoes, though, we talked about, and uh, coffee, tobacco uses this pathway. But things like grasses, like cereals, uh, wheat, don't. So it's kind of interesting that it could be applicable in some circumstances. And this brings up a broader question of uh, evolutionary separation between different plant types and why did this pathway get lost in some plants and not others and maybe it, is it on its way out what do you mean by that just uh if it's dispensable where some plants can survive without it is there a special reason why some plants keep hanging on to this pathway and continue using it to make their thylakoid membranes or is it slowly being selected against because it might not be necessary how does this protein in Rabidopsis translate to other species? This protein is found in Arabidopsis, but we're still trying to see if there's homologs or similar proteins in other plant species. It's possible that other plant species don't use this protein based on their lipid makeup. So this protein participates in a particular uh, part of lipid metabolism in the chloroplast that's not found throughout all plants, but some important crop plants we grow. 
you say crop plants, would this translate to help people with farming then? It's possible. We haven't learned enough about this protein and pathway to understand all the implications of this work, but there are um, important crops, tobacco, coffee, tomatoes, along with herbs like parsley that use this pathway. So it's possible that there could be implications for how we grow those plants and maybe we can um, take advantage of our new knowledge or future knowledge about this pathway to help them be more resistant to cold or drought. I believe potatoes also use this pathway. I'm going to have a slightly controversial question. Technically, then, if you grow that, it would be labeled as like a GMO then, right? Yes, technically. What is your opinion of GMOs? This is indeed a very controversial question for many people. My opinion of GMOs is that there's um, there's an importance in not fearing GMOs, but understanding GMOs. This is something that I come across a lot in my field, in my area of work. Since I am a plant biochemist and I work with, play with genes and change things up in plants, I think it's important to approach this with a sympathetic uh, mindset because I think the public concern about GMOs is it's very personal, it's very real. People are worried about scientists messing with their food, with with plants. I think it's a very valid concern. I think if we can meet in the middle as scientists and uh, the public and discuss the the real implications of what GMOs could do and help us uh, in feeding the world and, and do it in a safe way where the scientists take care of making sure that it's safe and then the public makes sure that it's possible. Cameron, what's your opinion? Yeah, I I feel strongly about this. Uh, I think we will need to rely on GMOs more and more as time goes on because the population is growing very rapidly. And yeah, organic sounds nice, but it's not realistic to feed the whole world. And if you can improve crop yields by changing the blueprints of how the plant develops the genetic code, then it's a very powerful tool and it could be one of the best routes to helping more people get fed or even making the cost of food go down. And it's really important to have these kinds of conversations. I believe a lot of the reason why people have a fear for GMOs is simply because they don't understand it. And instead of putting those people down for not understanding, it's really important for us as scientists to be that translator between the science that we're doing and showing people that everything we're doing is mainly to help them and them only, never to hurt them. Cameron, you, you had mentioned this genomic things that you guys are doing. Did you learn all of this this summer or have you learned this from your previous uh, research experience or do you have previous research experience? Yeah, I can talk about that first and segue into this internship. So I work in Dr. John Sedbrook's lab at Illinois State University and I started there a little over a year ago, and there they're working with CRISPR, if you've heard of that. It's a very new gene editing technology where you can basically put in a construct into the genome, and it will be expressed, and it can edit certain parts for you. And you can later screen out that construct that is being expressed so you can take it out of the plant to make sure nothing keeps happening after you make your desired mutation. So I come from the cellular part of biology, and Going into this biochemistry lab was really interesting because I hadn't ever done things like lipid profiling or even Western blots involve a lot of chemistry, and that's how you detect protein levels. So it's all very applicable, but there's probably nine out of ten things I did this summer were brand new. How do you profile a lipid? It's a very long procedure, (laughs) but basically you take plant tissue Uh, You put them through some chemical steps, and that will separate the lipids from the rest of the tissue. And you can centrifuge them at high speeds to separate them even more. And then you put them through more chemicals, and you can draw out the layer that ends up picking them up. And you can run that on something called a TLC plate, which is basically, if you imagine a glass tile with a white 
surface. Uh, it's made of silica, and you can put the concentrated lipids at the bottom, and you can run a solvent up the plate, and it will separate the lipids based on their polarity. And from there, you can mark where the lipids are, and you can actually scrape them off with a razor blade, and you can put them through more chemical processes, and you can detect which types of lipids are in that solvent. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I honestly never heard about that before. <laughs> yeah, I think Anastasia's lab, uh, her PI, had a big part in developing these techniques. That's really cool. Yeah. And they're used by labs all across the country, the same techniques. Wait a minute. Did you mention any previous research experience, or is this the first time you've been in a laboratory? No, I, I, I'm in a lab at Illinois State. Uh, like I said, it's John Sedbrick's lab there, and he's actually developing a crop right now. He's part of a team of other universities that are trying to turn what is currently classified as a common weed. It's called pennycress. That's its common name. And it has a lot of seeds. That's the noteworthy observation about this plant. So they're engineering, I should say we, we're engineering this plant to have even bigger seeds with more specific lipid types. For example, if you have a lot of lipids that have long carbon chains on them, I would say 18 chains or 18 carbons or more is long. Uh, if you have an oil made up of mostly long carbon chains, it will be very viscous, so it's thick. Uh, but if you can learn how to decrease the carbon chains with genetic engineering, then you can get a less viscous oil. And that can be more applicable for drop-in biodiesel fuels. Because if you put a thicker oil in a car, even after you process it and refine it, uh, it's going to gum up the engine and you need a thinner oil. So uh, lipids are very energy dense. So they have a lot of promise for the biofuel industry. It's basically you can't do biofuel without lipid engineering. And how's the progress been with that project? Uh, it's great right now. Um, we, we work with the University of Minnesota, uh, Western Illinois University. And there's actually a company that we work with. They're called Covercress. And the goal is to have this crop launched by 2021. And actually, my professor just got a new grant funded from the Department of Energy. It's a $10 million grant. So he's going to be in charge of directing how the funds get allocated. And um, the grant's purpose, like in one sentence, is to close the gap on any problems we have that are currently stopping us from launching the crop. So it's to fix any problems we have left. I find that very interesting that the Department of Energy was the one that granted this grant. Uh, it just goes to show that not only is the Department of Energy interested in things such as nuclear energy, but they're also looking at plant energy. I would have thought that would have been something more managed by the Department of Agriculture, so I think that's really interesting. How do you release a crop? There's a lot of regulations you have to go through. Um, I'm not super informed on every step mm -hmm. because it's mainly him and the other colleagues he has at other universities that are making all the big decisions, but you need to get everything regulated by an agency called APHIS. I believe they're within the, United, the USDA, so the Department of Agriculture, but um, you have to prove that what you're doing is very safe, especially because it's a new crop. Um, it's not like we're changing wheat, like it's already existing. We need to make sure that this isn't going to go out into the environment and start causing problems. Right, like become an invasive species or something right. like that. Even though the plant we're working with right now is already in every state in the country. So it's actually all around the world. But it's important not to have it, you know, escaping the farms and causing problems in areas that shouldn't be. Do you mind if I follow up on something you said about the Department of Energy funding plant research? Absolutely. I wanted to sort of maybe, maybe make a plug for the plant research laboratory which my lab is a part of and my PI is the director of. It's actually been funded by the DOE for the last 50 years. It was um, a pretty amazing, it's a pretty amazing collaborative effort between you know, maybe a dozen or so labs and there are three main projects that focus on energy, um, photosynthesis, and uh, more of a synthetic biology approach to understanding photosynthetic organisms. It's pretty cool conglomerate of, of many really smart people. I had really no idea. This opened my mind to that possibility, honestly. Truth is in science. 
Yeah, there's other big crops out there, like switchgrass is heavily researched in here in Europe, and um, it's a very common plant. It looks like grass, and it basically is grass. But another cool thing about that plant, I don't study it, but uh, the root systems can become huge. They, they have a lot of promise for carbon sequestration and things like that, um, as well as, you know, developing more energy for the country. Um, it hasn't actually been implemented and commercialized or anything, but it's a crop that is also being worked on. So so how large of a plant would you need to actually extract usable fuel from this kind of crop? Well, you can have trade-offs. Like you can have a huge field of smaller plants because our plant in my lab, again, is only maybe three feet tall at the, the highest. Um, so with that, you'd need a lot of land and um, a lot of plants to make up for the, the fact that it's small. But there are other farms that can grow trees even that can be harvested. And my lab does seed oil because a lot of seeds are dense with lipids. But even plant matter, the biomass, can be converted with chemical processes from carbon and things called lignin. They're big molecules that are meant to be defense molecules. Um, it's like the armor of the plant, kind of. Even with plants that don't have bark, it's like a strong molecule. And there are some intense chemical processes that can degrade those into basic building blocks, and then you can turn those building blocks into things like ethanol, and that can be used to add to gasoline and stuff. Or make alcohol. That's true. Yeah, we had once interviewed someone a few months ago about uh, biofuels and whatnot from plants. And to add on to what you were saying, there is probably so many different ways that you can isolate that lipid or that oil from that biofuel because you could probably distill it or you can break it down like with the mass and whatnot. And they're probably still trying to perfect the different ways to get the fuel from that. There are a lot of different approaches scientists are taking. In my own lab, we've tried uh, creating more oil in the vegetative tissues of things like grasses in hopes to extract more oil from every part of the plant versus just the seed. Well, thank you for giving us a little bit of that insight on the work that you're doing over at your home institution. Anastasia, can you enlighten us a little bit about what your thesis is going to be mainly focused on? Is there any components from the summer research that is going to be going into your thesis? The work that we're doing this summer has been a huge contribution to what I think is going to be an, a publication coming up soon. I've been working on this project since I got to the lab about four years ago. So I started this from scratch, and it's been my my baby. I've been working on this project uh, my my entire time at MSU. So characterizing this protein is really important to me, and Cameron's helped a lot this summer. So I'm really excited about publishing this work, and this will be a chapter in my dissertation. I'm uh, hopeful that it'll be published soon before my defense. I'm hoping to graduate this fall, but Cameron's definitely worked really hard this summer and earned a spot on that paper as an author. So I'm excited to continue working with him even after he leaves on publishing that manuscript. But then what is the topic of your thesis? The topic of my thesis is plant glycerolipid metabolism and potential regulation of it through preolysis. So using this cutting of peptides or other proteins to, as a signal or a method of controlling the way that Arabidopsis or other plants potentially make Plant, uh, their lipids in the chloroplast. Are there any plants that you've studied in the past that led you up to this point right now about your Arabidopsis? I have worked with Arabidopsis in the past, but I've actually worked with uh, several other model plants like Brachypodium, which is a grass model species, and even Poplar, which is a tree. So Arabidopsis was more of a new new thing for me when I started graduate school. I wasn't very familiar with it. So there's a lot of things to learn about growing Arabidopsis and, and work, um, manipulating the genetics of Arabidopsis. But that's all part of grad, the graduate school experience. You kind of dive in head first and, and learn what you need. And um, by the end of it, hopefully contribute, contribute to the field. 
are the results that you have found with previous model plants that you've studied in the past couple of years matching up to what you're seeing with the results that you've been obtaining this summer? So there's a couple of publications on this protein in particular that did not at all focus on the lipids. But the interesting thing is there's a similar similar protein in the same family in uh, the neuron, the mitochondria of human neurons that has a similar function where it cleaves itself. So that was kind of an exciting finding uh, for both of us because it sort of connects these two very far-flung proteins to maybe have a similar mechanism of action. When you're saying that it cleaves itself, what would that result in? Like, how would that affect the process of all of this? So we don't actually know yet. This is pretty new for us. Uh, We're still trying to characterize to what extent and what part is being cleaved and what that means for this protein in particular. But in a human system, essentially, this cleavage results into a less active form of this enzyme. So it's a protease, and then it shuts itself off by cleaving a part of it itself off. Is that good or bad that it shuts itself off? Because regulation could be good or bad if it's on or off. Right. The, in this case, it controls the kind of health state of mitochondria in humans. So this particular protein uh, will stop uh, redirecting the trafficking of another protein, which will cause uh, mitophagy, so the breakdown of mitochondria in the human neurons. And this kind of keeps healthy mitochondria in check to make sure that they're healthy. So if, if these mitochondria are starting to become old and non-functional or there's something wrong with them, there's a mechanism. This is a way of making sure that they get broken down. So if this process isn't properly functioning, it could lead to things like Parkinson's or other uh, neurological diseases. Anastasia, what has been your favorite part about mentoring Cameron during this summer experience? And then I'd like to hear from you, Cameron, as well, what your favorite part about uh, having Anastasia as your mentor been this entire summer? I've had a phenomenal summer working with Cameron. I'm really excited that he decided to come to our lab for the summer and work with me. He's been very enthusiastic about all the work. I I gave him a lot to work on, and he didn't bat an eye and sat down and did all the work and has continuously uh, surprised me with really, really intelligent questions. Um, his thirst for knowledge is really refreshing. Yeah, and I'd like to say that uh, Anastasia was a great example of how the best leaders lead by example. Um, they show you what they mean. Uh, they make sure you know what you're doing. They don't just send you off to do whatever and hope it works out. She really made sure that I knew how to do the protocols, and if I didn't, she would show me, and then she would let me go further and further on my own after that. But um, And really, to see someone plan experiments with such... Finesse, honestly, like she was very thorough and the ideas were really creative and everything made sense. They were the kind of experiments where even if they didn't work out exactly how you intended, you could still learn something from it. And Cameron, what was the hardest part about transitioning from a cellular biology lab to a biochemistry lab? Honestly, it was things pretty simple like doing math for chemistry again. Um, I like chemistry, but... uh, There were some things that tripped me up that I'm a lot more confident with now, but at the time I did need a lot of help with. Both of you are graduating within the next year, Cameron, an undergraduate and Anastasia and graduate, so you're going to be a doctor soon. What are your plans for when you graduate? So I'm pretty excited to wrap up my PhD this fall. I am lining up a postdoc actually here at MSU at another wonderful lab. Uh, I was very fortunate that Kristen Parent's lab was interested in working with me uh, as a postdoc, and there I'll be studying giant viruses. It's a quite a big shift from plant lipids, but it's more about learning the, the technique of imaging um, things like giant viruses and membrane proteins and complexes. So it's more of a structural biology approach. So I'm 
excited about this big change, but I'll have to learn a lot and read a lot. Uh, my plans are definitely to continue with uh, CRISPR and genetic engineering techniques. Uh, biochemistry was great to learn the how and the why of all this is happening, but I really like application sciences, so I really want to continue doing the research I'm doing now um, in my lab back at Illinois State University, but I'm keeping an open mind, and I know there's a lot of good schools out there, so um, as long as it has to do with genetics. It sounds then that you're considering graduate school. Yes, of course. Cool. Uh, that is the next step for me. I would actually like to apply directly to PhD programs. Yeah, it's a really great path that a lot of people take. The only reason why I didn't assume that in the very beginning is because I know a lot of people that will often consider just going straight into industry after their undergrad. So I'm glad that you're able to figure and make that decision. And it's good that this RU program was able to help you decide as to what you want to focus on because you might always wonder later on, oh, did I want to go down this path or not? Um, Anastasia, you said viruses, though. Do you mean viruses and plants? Well, she said giant viruses. What does yeah, that even yeah. mean? <laughs> They're very big. So these are, this is not a plant-related research field. I'm going, venturing into something new and different. Oh, okay. So these are like animal cells. Okay, cool, because I've never heard about giant viruses in plants. <laughs> so they get quite large, and these this, the one virus in particular they study, the giant samba virus, infects amoebas. So it's, it's quite different from what I'm doing now, but I think the really exciting part about biochemistry is it's very versatile and transferable. So if you know how to be a biochemist, you can study a huge variety of, of topics. You've spent a lot of time with different uh, plant projects, so what made you want to switch? I wanted to expand my repertoire of techniques that I know, so learning how to solve structures of, of different proteins, uh, complexes, or protein capsids interests me a lot, and I think this would be applicable for any future work I do back in plant systems. Anastasia, Cameron, thank you so much for joining both of us today. We really do appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having us. Thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in. And remember, the truth is in the science. If you're a current or visiting undergraduate student that would like to be interviewed with your graduate student mentor, please reach out to us at scifiles at impact89fm.org. See you next week on The Sci-Files.